Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the MarkForged webinar. Uh, this uh, installation is the Complete Metal Solution. I'm John Riley, uh, the VP of Product. I'm here with Alexander Kreese, one of our content engineers, and we're going to walk you through metal printing from MarkForged. Um, if, uh, if you have questions, there'll be a uh, opportunity at the end of the presentation to ask them. Um, I don't think we'll get to all of the answers, but um, hopefully we can get through uh, a few questions there. If we're not able to answer them uh, on the uh, live webinar, we'll uh, both have a recording of it for everyone to review afterwards um, in case you missed something, as well as uh, we'll try and reach out individually and answer uh, everyone's uh, individual questions. Okay, great. Let's get started. We'll start with a brief look at the agenda. I'll begin by introducing Mark Forged for those of you who don't know us. Uh, then we'll uh, talk about a customer case study and show you how they went from design to actual part. We'll review the return on investment uh, and then the question section I just mentioned. Okay, about Mark Forged. We were founded out of MIT in 2013. We shipped our first printer in 2014. And our mission is to unlock the next 10x in innovation in design and manufacturing. We've grown a lot since we shipped that first printer. We now have a global fleet of printers. Uh, we're in uh, thousands, thousands and thousands of printers in over 50 countries worldwide. Um, because many of our printers are networked, uh, the network printers dial home and show us their IP address. You can see on this map sort of our uh, global presence. Um, so we're, uh, we're expanding uh, further and further worldwide. Uh, and that's, uh, that growth has been driven because we offer, we're the only company to offer the full range of materials from plastics to metals to uh, fiber reinforced composites. But today we're gonna focus on metals. So let's start with a customer case study. Dixon Valve and Coupling is a uh, global manufacturer of hoves, fittings, and accessories. They've been in business for over 100 years. Uh, they offer the broadest range of coupling products in the market. Um, and uh, you don't survive 100 years as a manufacturing company without being innovative. Um, Dixon Valve has sort of led the charge on moving to automated manufacturing in their industry. Um, and that's been able to drive a great deal of profitabil profitability and flexibility for the product lines that they make. Today we're gonna to look at one uh, individual particular problem that they're facing, um, which is an automated manufacturing cell uh, that makes a steam pipe coupling. Uh, you're looking here at the, uh, at the pictures of the steam pipe coupling on a tray. Uh, these things are cast and then machined and galvanized. And uh, the last step of the final assembly process is to um, put in a polymer crush ring and they press that into the part before they ship it to customers. Um, unfortunately, when they machine these things, uh, the uh, insides of the couplings are incredibly sharp. You can see that the threads are uh, present inside. Those are very sharp threads. And uh, the way that they press in that crush ring, they use an automated cell. Um, they have a robot arm with a gripper on it, which inserts into the inner diameter of the coupling, uh, expands, picks it up, and moves it to the press fitting station. Uh, they press fit that polymer ring in. Uh, and then uh, it puts it into the output flow, which you're looking at here. Um, that uh, sharp thread on the inside is really abrasive to the gripper on the end of that robot arm. So they're wearing through uh, these jaws very quickly. Um, they need to make them out of a hard material. If they need to make them out of a hard material, now they're machining things like stainless steel. That's slow, difficult, and expensive. And if these jaws wear or break, um, now you've got line stoppages. Uh, Dixon has a lot of flexibility in the types of parts that they make, so often they're changing out this tool as well um, as they're changing the shape or type of the couplings that they're manufacturing in this automated cell. So that's the problem that they face. Uh, their solution requirements, they need a uh, gripper jaw for the end of that robot arm that's robust, um, that has an incredibly high life cycle, uh, high surface hardness so that those sharp threads inside of the part don't eat it, eat it away. Um, and then they need the ability to quickly change the nature of that tooling to minimize the downtime of this cell in their manufacturing line. Okay, let's look at the solution. Uh, the solution is 3D printed 17-4 gripper jaws. Uh, with the 3D printing uh, metal technology from MarkForge, they're able to go from art to the part itself the next day. They save $303 per gripper jaw 
Uh, you're looking at the picture of three of them here on each end effector, uh, each robot arm. Uh, so that means over $1,000 per robot installation, robot arm installation. And then they save on average against their machine shop 19.5 days of time. Uh, that's because their machine shop is incredibly busy. They have one in-house, uh, but they're primarily using it to machine high value customer parts. Uh, so when they need tooling for the manufacturing line machined, uh, they get in line and they have to wait. Um, so now they're able to uh, quickly and easily design gripper jaws for this uh, manufacturing cell uh, much faster uh, and uh, incredibly less expensive. All right, so uh, to understand how that all works, let's go through the process one step at a time and uh, explain how it, how it goes. We'll start with an overview. You start with designing your part. Um, you design uh, the part that you want just the way you normally would in your CAD software. You print it on the MarkForged Metal X printer. Uh, you bake it in an oven. There's a washing step between the printing and the sintering that we'll talk about, about and then uh, you're left with your final part. Uh, and so it's really a, you know, a series of steps that go from design to part, and you can do that in, uh, by the next day. So let's go step by step. Step one is designing your part and uploading it into the MarkForge software. Uh, you use the CAD software that you're familiar with today to create the part that you want. You don't have to worry about scaling because we handle that for you um, to account for shrinkage during the center process in our software. And then you simply upload an STL of that part to the uh, MarkForge Iger software. It, after you've designed and uploaded the part, it's really as simple as just hitting print. Uh, the part takes about three hours to print. I'm gonna show you a series of progressive images of that part being created. We would have liked to show it as a video, but it doesn't come across on the webinar very well. Um, but so uh, once you've hit print, the printer starts to print that part one layer at a time. Uh, what it's printing is metal powder, in this case, 17-4 stainless steel, that's been bound in plastic. Um, and so uh, unlike other traditional metal 3D printing technologies, that powder is now rendered safe because it's inside of a plastic binding system. Uh, we heat that plastic binder and print layer at a time. Uh, so here we will go through and watch that part be built one layer at a time, just like an FDM style part creation process that you're probably very familiar with. And three hours later, uh, you have your part. The next step is to take that part and put it in the washing station. The washing fluid removes about half of the binding material. It takes about nine hours to wash entirely through that part, um, cleaning out all of the uh, half of the binder material so that you're left with a part that's sort of sponge-like, uh, porous almost. Um, at this point, the part is a little bit more fragile, but it's not like so sensitive that you could break it without trying. Um, but, uh, but it takes about nine hours of wash time. It's uh, important to note that you cannot overwash the part. So if you leave it in there longer, that's fine. Uh, the only problem is underwashing. So you wanna make sure that the part is at least in the washing fluid, the uh, recommended amount of time. By the way, the washing station uh, is connected uh, to our software as is the sintering station, which we'll talk about next. Um, so we'll tell you exactly how long to wash it. We'll track that washing and you'll get an email when it's done washing. So this is really almost as simple as running your dishwasher uh, you place the part in the basket, drop it into the station, close the lid, and come back and get the part back out when the timer expires. Once the part has been washed and that first layer of binder has been removed, you move on to the sintering step. You place the part on a ceramic bed inside of the furnace. Uh, we have two options of tube furnace available. You slide that into the hot zone, the uniform hot zone inside of the furnace and you center the part for about 16 hours. During the sintering process, the part is run through a series of ramp and hold temperatures. Um, the first hold temperature burns out the remaining binder material, leaving you with powder that is held loosely together. Uh, as you continue up the temperature ramp, those small metal powders start to neck into each other and then eventually center together, um, pulling into a part that shrinks by about 20% and you're left with a final part that's fused up to 99, 98, 99.7% dense metal. The sintering time is about 16 hours, uh, and that includes the time from placing the part and hitting start until the part is cooled down and is ready to remove from the furnace. Uh, you can fit uh, multiple parts inside of the furnace, so uh, depending on which furnace you pick, the center one or the center two, we have uh, larger or smaller sintering areas. Um, so you can put as many parts as you can fit inside of that area uh, for each sintering run. 
And again, the uh, furnace is connected um, to our software, so we will monitor the sintering run for you while it's happening. Uh, you'll be able to log into the software to see where you're at in the process and how things are going. And when it's complete, you'll get an email that it's now time to go get your part. Okay, so here's the part on the actual uh, gripper jaw on their line. Uh, parts come off ready to be used. Uh, they have full isotropic strength. So if you're familiar with sort of uh, layer at a time manufacturing and 3D printing, uh, traditionally, uh, the Z axis strength is a little bit weaker than the other axes because those layers are being built one at a time. But in the sintering process, you actually get crystal growth that goes across the axes. Um, so your parts are isotropically strong. Um, and then uh, the part is just the metal that you chose to print with. So in this case, stainless 17.4, uh, you can choose to do any type of post-processing that you would traditionally do on that metal. Um, the tolerance is Similar to cast, uh, you should think about it like near net shape. Um, so if you have a critical tolerance, um, you can just pop this thing in a CNC and polish up uh, whatever that critical tolerance is um, to get it exactly right. And then here it is uh, in use, uh, locating that fixture on the uh, rubber ring, the, the polymer ring you can see there at the bottom um, that will then uh, press fit that together for final shipping. Okay, so uh, they were successfully able to print their gripper jaws. Let's look at their return on investment. When they were machining that part in-house, the cost was around $315. The all-up cost uh, on the Metal X is $11.45 a part. That's about $6 of material cost, and the rest is uh, allocated across washing fluid and the uh, gas that is used to run the furnace to create the atmosphere inside the furnace during sintering. Um, the savings per part uh, then is like $303, which is 96.4% uh, against their traditional manufacturing mechanism. And then of course time, uh, time is really critical in a manufacturing environment. Uh, they're now able to get their part by mid the next day, instead of waiting around on the machine shop, uh, that cuts down uh, weeks of time from their process and gets them to uh, about a 92 or 93% savings in time. Um, so that's why, uh, why this makes a lot of sense for them. They're able to accelerate uh, their ability to react to changes, uh, to change parts going through the automated line, and to uh, replace broken parts uh, incredibly quickly, and uh, save a lot of money, about $1,000 an instance while doing it. So those are the crucial benefits. They get parts the next day. Their workflow is simplified. If any of you have worked with a machine uh, shop in the past, often you need to cut drawings. Um, dimension those drawings, uh, then hand them off to be machined. Sometimes you need to create work holding fixtures. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into having a part machined. Uh, complexity is free with 3D printing, so it's a much easier problem. You go straight from the design to printing the exact part that you're going to need. That lets you get, get products to market much faster, um, and it increases your profitability of your manufacturing line.